everyone and welcome back to Tea Time Thoughts. I'm Kaylin as always and today while I drink my cup of nice soothing chamomile tea I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about the mythology of ancient Egypt and I think for a lot of us when we think of mythology we immediately think of Greek or Roman mythology. Maybe we think of Disney's Hercules or Renaissance art or Percy Jackson or Percy Jackson the movie if you want to be controversial and a little spicy but what about Egyptian mythology? That's something that we usually don't hear about quite as much. I mean I think my greatest exposure to Egyptian mythology as a kid was playing the fourth grade level Clue Finders. And I don't know if any of you guys played this or remember this, but Clue Finders was lit. Although sixth grade Clue Finders was like an absolute nightmare. So basically they went underground into this plant world and one of the girls like got kidnapped and they had to solve all these puzzles. Otherwise she was going to get turned into a plant and she was like turned part way and it, uh, I think that might have messed me up a little bit, but I also never finished that though. So part of me is kind of curious. I want to go back and finish it. Maybe I'll have to like dig through my closet and find that disc. Anyways, back to business. I'm willing to bet that a lot of us, even if we don't know much about Egyptian mythology, we have this image of Egyptian gods in our heads that we can put together pretty easily. Usually we see some kind of man with an animal head, like a jackal or a falcon of, or an eagle of some kind holding staffs or something, or maybe we think of the sphinxes. And given that these creatures aren't actually real, it shows us how prevalent the idea that these creatures were to the Egyptian people. So if we look into Egyptian society, the mythology actually has a ton of influence on Egyptian life from governing practice of powerful pharaohs to basically the way you live your day-to-day -day lives. I'm having a tough time getting this bag to steep as well. So something you need to know about mythology is that it's very closely related to religion or spirituality. And that's why so many myths tell tales of moral decisions and the classic poetic justice that we see in a lot of these myths. And there's usually a reward for good people and punishment for bad people and, and so forth. So we might wonder why people believed in this, but to people at the time, it was very important to them because it helps them to make sense of the world around them. And if you're religious, I think you can understand this because religion is a way that a lot of people find comfort in the world and in the universe. So according to mythology, one of the big questions is where did Egypt come from? And from there, where did the entire world come from. And when it comes to the creation of the world, in Egyptian mythology, they believe that the gods created the earth. But one thing to keep in mind is that there are different accounts of who was responsible for the creation. And this is probably because people would change the narrative based on the gods that they favored. But overall, the concept of creation has remained consistent. So I want to tell you two myths today in particular. So we're going to discuss the creation of the world according to Egyptian mythology and basically the myth behind the governing of ancient Egypt. So based on the myth of creation, the universe started out as nothing but darkness, like this great void of deep water and just this swirling chaos with no specific purpose or meaning. And it was essentially just emptiness. However, there existed a god in this empty universe. Some say that it was Heka, the god of magic. And this god was just waiting for the perfect moment to arrive. And soon there emerged this hill. And as this mound rose, standing at the top was the god Atum or, or Ta, depending on the version. So he looked around this great big universe and he noticed that he was alone. So he did what any person would do in that situation and he mated with his own shadow and gave birth to two children. The first child was Shu, the god of air, who he spat out, and Tefnut, who he threw up. The miracle of life, y'all. <laughs> So Shu gave the world the guidelines of life and Tefnut gave the world guidelines of order. And so with those sort of thrown out into the world, they both wandered off to basically assemble the rest of the world. And Atum came to really miss his children. So at one point he decided to take out his eye and have it search the earth for them so he could find them and reunite with them. And eventually, while Shu and Tefnut were out creating the world, they found the eye and they returned it to him and he cried tears of joy and his tears then fell on the earth and created humanity. 
And this symbol of the eye is something that becomes very important throughout ancient Egypt. A lot of people refer to it as perhaps the eye of Ra or the eye of a tomb. And that's why you'll see a lot of these watching eyes in a lot of Egyptian artwork and literature because it, they're the eyes of the gods watching over humanity. So humanity's been created, what next? So in order to give these new humans a place to live, Shu and Tefnut mated. And just a side note, this is a theme you're going to see a lot of in Egyptian mythology. And you might think, huh, that's sort of weird. But thankfully, that's not precedence for the real world, right? Well, actually, no. This tradition would be followed by a lot of pharaohs in the future. Both King Tut and Cleopatra were actually married to their siblings, just to name a few. And, of course, we might think, well, that's wrong. But at the time, they did it in an attempt to keep the bloodline pure. So they were kind of the ancient world Habsburg if you will. <laughs> so Shu and Tefnut were able to create the earth called Geb and the sky called Newt. And Geb and Newt, or the earth and the sky, fell in love, but Atum wouldn't stand for it. So he separated them and they were able to always see each other, but they were never able to touch. And in a way, this makes sense because the sky is obviously what we see above us when we're planted on the ground. But by the time a tomb had tried to separate the two of them, Newt had already given birth to five gods. We have Osiris, Isis, not the terrorist group, Set, Nephethys, and Horus. And these are the five most prominent gods that we'll see in mythology, particularly when it comes to the myth that kind of leads to the background of Egyptian society that we'll discuss here in a bit. And these are going to be the big players. So first you need to know Osiris, and he's the Egyptian god of a few different things like agriculture, fertility, the afterlife, the dead, and the final judgment. So what's interesting is he's the god of things that create life. He's also the god of death and what happens to you after you die. And then next you have Isis, Osiris's wife. I told you this was going to come up a lot and we're not done yet. So her name means the seat and she's basically a symbol of stability and she's this overarching mother figure of Egypt and she's specifically considered the mother of all pharaohs and she's also responsible for the flowing of the Nile which is an essential factor of Egyptian life. It really played a great deal into their agriculture and their transportation of goods. It was something that a lot of people in Egypt relied upon to maintain not only a regular life but to maintain a profitable one as well and so next we have set or seth depending on who you ask um who is osiris's brother but set is the god of storms deserts disorder and violence and if you couldn't tell by that description he's basically going to be the villain in a great deal of the myths next we have i'm sorry if i butcher the pronunciation on this or if i change it part way through nephetheus who is the sister of osiris isis horus and set and set's wife and she is considered the mistress of the house meaning that she's basically kind of the opposite of what isis is isis Isis is this nurturing mother, and Nephetheus is more of the strict governess type, but she also has this association with death and mourning that she gets from her brother slash husband. That's not a phrase I really thought I would say on this podcast, but here we are. So the myth that these five figures are mainly involved in, it's also known as the Osiris myth, and I'll get more into that after this. Hey ladies, this is Kaylin from Tea Time Thoughts. Whether you're new to podcasts or consider yourself a longtime listener, if you haven't heard of Girl, you're in for a treat. Girl is a podcast all about empowering women to be their best selves with segments like personal problems, we all have plenty of those, and conversations on a variety of topics from boys to entrepreneurship. If you like the dynamic of Tea Time Thoughts, you're sure to love the back and forth banter of Amaya, a Pisces, and Paige, a Libra, as they share their self-proclaimed mediocre advice and embarrassing stories. To join the movement of girls from all over, Catch the latest episodes by searching girl, all caps, exclamation point, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Anchor. And follow at girl the podcast on Instagram and most other social media platforms. Bye, girl. And now, back to this. The Osiris myth is probably one of the most famous ones in Egyptian mythology. So it starts off with Osiris ruling Egypt and doing his thing, and Isis is his queen, and everything's chill on the hill. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. So... Osiris is out there trying to create this beautiful Egypt. He's planting trees and he's creating water for the Nile and he wants to put together this harmony 
throughout Egypt. And Set, who decides he's going to kill Osiris, has started plotting something behind his back. Now, the reason for why Set decides to murder his brother depends on the version. Some say that he wanted to rule Egypt and let chaos be free. Some say that he was jealous. Some say that it was because he wanted to get back at Osiris for sleeping with his wife slash sister. (laughs) And my personal favorite is that Set wanted to get back at Osiris for kicking him. And I just think that's hilarious. And frankly, I know that all these are probably legitimate versions of the myth. But as for me and my house, we will say that Set was upset that Osiris kicked him. So Set comes up with the perfect murder scene. He decides to throw this huge party and invite all the VIPs, including his brother, and he proposes a challenge. He makes this very beautiful, extravagant coffin, and it's just decked out and absolutely stunning. And he says, whoever can fit inside this coffin gets to keep it, which is so funny because when we think about death today, usually we don't think about having to purchase a coffin And by the time I think someone would need to purchase a coffin for us is when we are dead and don't have a say in the matter anymore. But in Egyptian culture, they have a very big emphasis on the afterlife. They want to take things in their tomb with them. They believe that whatever they're buried with or the things that are enclosed with them are the things that they get to take with them to the afterlife. So naturally, they see this sweet decked out ride through the underworld and they're like, heck yeah, man, I'd love to get my paws on that coffin. So everybody is jumping in and trying to see how they fit. But little do they know that Set had made the coffin with the specific measurements of a Osiris. And so Osiris finally hops in and he's like, hey, it fits. I win. I get to keep it. And Set's like, you sure do. And he slams it shut and throws the coffin in the Nile. And then Set goes back to everybody at the party and is like, hey, everyone, Osiris is dead. Bummer deal. And Isis wasn't buying it. So she went out to search for Osiris. And eventually she found the coffin and got Osiris's body and decided to go about the resurrection process. So she went to go gather the herbs and stuff. And she had her sister, Nephetheus, um, watch the body. And meanwhile, Set was like, oh, shoot, I probably should make sure Isis doesn't find the body. And he goes to Nephetheus and says, hey, do you know where the body is? And she's like, nah, man, I don't know anything about that. And he was like, yeah, you do. Where is it? So eventually she snitches and shows it to him. And he splits the body into, again, depending on the source, 14 pieces or 42 pieces. And he hides them all over Egypt. So Isis comes home and she sees that her husband's body is gone. And she's pretty upset about it, you know, as you are when your husband's murdered and stolen from you. And Nephetheus felt pretty guilty about this and told her what happened and offered to help. So they went through Egypt and they found as many of the pieces as they could. And they built a temple where they found a piece establishing basically the 42 provinces of Egypt. And eventually Isis is able to reconstruct Osiris and mate with him. And she becomes pregnant with their son Horus. But eventually Osiris decides to descend into the underworld and judge the dead in the afterlife. He doesn't really feel quite as complete anymore. So Horus is raised in secret to hide him from Set until he grows up. And Horus, once he does grow up, he decides to pull an Inigo Montoya and avenge his father. Or I guess you could say a Philip Hamilton, but I don't know. It's a little too soon for me to discuss that one. So he challenges Set to a fight and they throw hands all over the Nile. And in some instances, they say that Set took the form of a hippo and tried to fight Horus within the Nile River. And when you think about it at first, that might not be super threatening. But then when you remember how dangerous hippos are, that's actually really freaking scary. I don't know about you guys, but like hippos have no business being able to like open their jaws and unhinge them the way that they do. Like they kill more people per year than lions do. And I don't know. I just, you don't need to open your mouth that wide. You don't need to be able to crush a watermelon with your jaw. I don't know, maybe in an evolutionary sense they needed to, but it's just freaky. So yeah, I'm scared of hippos, and Horus eventually won the fight, and he was able to restore balance to the realm and the force. (laughs) And he can rule with justice and advice from his mother and his aunt. So that's the basic overview of the Osiris myth. And now that we've kind of gotten a glimpse of that, we think, okay, wow, these stories are pretty interesting, but what what was their significance to them? So 
Mythology actually has had a lot of influence in a lot of different aspects of Egyptian culture and in Egyptian life. And as I mentioned a bit before, we see a lot of mythological influence in Egyptian art, literature, and architecture, and so forth. There are a ton of images portraying the gods, and there are a lot of different icons that are associated with specific gods. For instance, um, one of Isis's icons is the scorpion because she had scorpions that were loyal to her protect her and Horus from Set when Set was essentially kind of ruling over Egypt with his demons. What's interesting too is a lot of the tombs of dead in Egypt, particularly in the rulers of Egypt, are painted with and written with these different symbols and stories. And I think we all know about how symbolic the pyramids are too. And they represent this mound that we first saw in the myth. And the point of these pyramids at the top, it's kind of like a compass pointing to the sun, which illuminates the sun god's pathway along the horizon and the sort of path that the pharaoh will be able to walk when he descends and can officially become one of the gods himself. Because basically the view of the pharaoh is that he is practically one of the gods and his death and separation from the mortal life is going to be significant in his passing on to the next one. So he needs to have all of these icons of the gods with him. He needs to have all of these ways to access them. And as I said, that's why we see a lot of these elaborate burials more commonly with Egyptian pharaohs and rulers. And as I mentioned before, the perhaps the biggest influence of Egyptian mythology is in religion. The myths are specifically shown to demonstrate the importance of morality and of good triumphing over evil. They're also very heavily involved with nature. The gods are usually pretty intricately entwined with, with nature. And as we mentioned a bit with the Nile, nature has a lot to do with life in Egypt. It all comes down to the Nile, and since the Nile has a pretty regulated pattern, in a way it makes sense for the people who adhere to this mythology to notice that the gods are appeased when the Nile seems to be behaving as, as usual, but when there's some sort of storm or a drought or when the Nile floods or perhaps runs lower than usual, then it's a way for these people to understand the reasoning behind what's going on and how they can attempt to fix the situation. And again, I think the influence of this mythology is the same sort of influence we have with religion in our lives. And what's interesting too is it's another hint of why religion or mythology in different cultures is kind of assembled in different ways based on the location. Because if we look at Mesopotamian mythology, if we look at the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, they don't have this same sort of predictable pattern that the Nile has. So their mythology and their beliefs end up being created somewhat differently because the lives that they lead are different. And I don't know, it's just so fascinating to me. And what I love as I kind of go back and research some of these older societies or societies that have had a lot of influence on the ways that we live today, it's interesting to see the foundation of some of the beliefs that the people then had and how they play into the beliefs that we have as a society today. So that's it for this week. I want to thank Girl the Podcast for doing a promo swap with me. I'm very excited to have this partnership with them and I really appreciate all that they do to help make women feel heard and empowered. Please give them a listen. I completely recommend them. If you enjoyed this podcast or if you enjoyed this discussion, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe, or follow. Every platform is different. And if you're interested in leaving a review, you can go to ratethispodcast.com slash thoughts. If you feel like doing that, I would really appreciate it. It really helps to boost the podcast and I would be happy to hear some more of your thoughts about discussions that we could have in the future or aspects of the show that you've enjoyed. So thanks for listening and don't forget to tune in next week when I talk a bit about the scandalous man that was Lord Byron and how the poetry that he wrote and how the poetry that he wrote seems pretty different from the wildlife that he lived. Thanks for listening. This is Tea Time Thoughts, and I'll talk to you next week. Mm-hmm.